Hey everyone, uh, once again, I am PJ, and this is my man, Michael Powell. And thank you for pulling up a chair, sitting down, open up your tabletop role-playing game books, and joining us at the table. Uh, we are going to speak briefly back on Lost Omens Character Guide to go in-depth with the organization. Not only the organizations in this book, but the really fun tool that Paizo gave us to build the stat blocks of our own organizations. We will probably see us talk a bit about this more in depth, discuss about Edge of Legend and some of their organizations, and the organizations that you might have heard about last time at, at the table. So by all means, pull open a chair, open up your books, and join us at the table. It's going to be fun. So now what we're going to do is to discuss uh, the organizations. Um, because what's really cool is how you get an initial prestige class or archetype, if you will, for joining an organization. And then as you grow and take on a specific role in that organization, that archetype, that character changes. But what are these organizations? So we first mentioned um, the Firebrand. And the Firebrand are like, you know, if you don't know who they are, they are free captains of the sea. They are, you know, destroyers of tyranny. Uh, wherever the wind goes, Patriots. takes their sails. Patriots, that whole lot. Mm -hmm. Hell Knights are like the ever-present Judge Dread, if you will. Yeah. Uh, they are the law, whether you like it or not. I am, the like law. <laughs> I am the law. I am the law. And they are the law, whether they like your laws or not. They will. They will tell you the laws. Um, you also have, if you want to play a uh, a paladin who's not so edgy and spoopy. You also have the the Knights of Last Wall. Last Wall is this really cool uh, group of people, also uh, kind of vying to fight tyranny, and they have this gigantic system, especially in this book, about the different classes within. Um, I kind of want to kind of call them. They're kind of like Templars. They're kind of like Templars. Very much so. They're like yeah. Templars, but they have different variations on how they on how they Templar. They're, um, they're the classic trope of. Uh, knights without a country, or like vet, like veteran warriors who lost, who basically was on the losing side. Exactly, exactly, very much like that. There's a lot of really cool stuff, and a lot of it all comes down to this uh, this oath that they swear, and that oath does have um, a really big import on who they are as last wall knights. Wait, and they so does, does it start with in brightest day, darkest night? No, but it should. Um, but let's use this though to talk about organizations uh, because they have this really cool tool for building these organizations. Um, and you can use that for anything. Uh, so the tool can be found on page... Yeah, my fingers, fat, slow fingers, cannot move fast enough. It can be found on page 64 and 65 in the book. So what's right. really cool about this is that this tool as a GM or even as a player, if you want to as a player, allows you to create the stats for your own group of people. So say you want to make the Green Lantern Corps. Um, you put in the organization name at the top, mm -hmm. the alignment, the size, and the other traits to follow in the list of things from there. So obviously, can we, can we uh, and, go through each of these stat blocks really quick? Oh, absolutely! Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, you want to go through the organization stat blocks or the stat? Uh, yeah, blocks um, because I was going to say, do you want? Let's go through each of them really quick, like the size of the the size of the organization would be small, would be about a hundred people. Mm -hmm. Then you get to medium, which is a hundred to a thousand; large, a thousand to five thousand; huge. 5,000 to 10,000, and then gargantuan, which is uh, 100, uh, was it 10,000 plus? Yeah. So, um, so for reference, let's go with the firebrands because we talked at length mm -hmm. about these guys. Um, they are a chaotic, good, large revolutionary force. Mm -hmm. And the revolutionary is that third part I mentioned earlier, which is the other traits. And those other traits we'll go into more depth in a minute. But they are a large force, meaning that you know the members of the Firebrands have about one to 5,000 members from that alone. So as a GM or a player, you can, you can, you can work this back to front, front to back. Say I'm a, I'm a GM. I'm like, okay, well, I'm a GM. Say, say I'm making an organization for the game. 
okay, well, I want this organization to have like 500,000 people all over the world, and that would be a gargantuan organization. No, that should be large. That would be large. Oh, uh, 500,000. Oh, 500. Okay. 500,000 would be gargantuan. But Mm -hmm. say I am Rufa, and I have a handful of students that I teach all over the world, but only a handful. So say that's maybe... That would be a small. Yeah, that would be a small. Hmm. Rufa School of How to Dance Well and Do Other Things Good Too, which is not the name of the school. I just came up with that. Um, would be a small, I would imagine, neutral good organization? Yeah, that, would so- that sounds about right. Neutral good. I would say yeah. true neutral. Maybe true neutral. Maybe. I mean, I would imagine... There are people you wouldn't want to teach dance to based on uh, a sense of morality. Yeah. But again, that depends on the group that you're with. So back to the firebrands here. Uh, They are a chaotic good, large, meaning they have about one to 5,000 people, and they're a revolutionary force. Uh, They have a little thing they write about them, grandstanding thrill seekers and dedicated rebels. So if you want to tell what your organization's about, Boom, a little mission statement right there. Now, going on this tool, uh, the scope and influence comes next, and it's there to convey the degree of influence the organization has. So this basically says, how much of the world are your people and your organization invested in? How much of the world are they present in? Mm -hmm. So maybe Rufa only has one school in uh, Grazi. Grazi, yeah. Grazi. So it would be a small... True neutral to neutral good organization. Uh, Other traits being a dance school slash academy. Um, The mission statement could... It would definitely be local. Local, yeah. Uh, Local meaning just that one city in Grassi. So the different sizes, you have local, uh, such as a city. Uh, Territory, such as a large chunk of land. Um, Let me rephrase that. An area, so a certain forest... Or a, a city. A city. Well, a city is is local. This would oh. be like, this could be like a tri-state area. So, like, you could a say a state. A state. Maybe. How about this? Yeah. You could say your. You could say one of two things. Local would be you have a school in the Bronx. Mm-hmm. But uh, territory would be you have one school in three boroughs of New York City. Okay. So you see, it's a little bigger yeah. than just one city. Okay. It's kind of an, more, but it's not quite the whole, the whole enchilada. Because mm-hmm. then we go to uh, national, which is definitely, if we're going with the New York model here, would be the entire state of New York. Or the entire country of the United States, depending on how you want to look at the metaphor of states and cities versus nations and I territories. I would say at national, that would be... Uh... Diff- it would be a franchise. It would be like a uh, brand, like you know, different school, like multiple schools. I could see that. Yeah, multiple schools, like maybe all up and down the East Coast, or yeah, you know, throughout throughout the both coasts. Uh, now you have regional, and regional is interesting because now what we're saying is that Rufa School of Dance has exploded to everywhere in North America and Canada. As it would, as it should, and then last but not least, we have global Mm -hmm. we have the mcdonald's dance studio all over the country all over the world it's it's when you franchise you franchise (laughs) exactly massive global franchise Mm -hmm. it's like the difference between a carl's jr and a mcdonald's because i know i'm from the east coast we don't have a carl's jr anywhere we may have that one stubborn hardy's in the south that refuses (laughs) to close their doors um but everywhere you go there's a bloody McDonald's. So. There you go. <laughs> Cindy just said, we sure don't. Yeah, we do not have a Carl's Jr. Uh, but depending on how far south you go, there will be that one. Hey. Sometimes you'll even find a Roy Rogers, which is my. At least you guys have Waffle House. Uh, don't get us started on Waffle House again. Covered and smothered. Uh, <laughs> um. 
Yeah, yeah. I see Malice, I see Malice uh, 1974. We, I agree with you. I've tried a ton of tabletop RPG games out there. Uh, some have like a nice idea here and there or a nice flavor, but I will say that Pathfinder 2nd Edition has, I think, the strongest character creator, the most fun system, and I'm, I'm really a big fan of it myself. And action economy. Oh, those, del- those glorious, glorious action economies. All right, uh, so uh, moving forward, um, the next would be, I believe, uh, goals, right? Yeah, absolutely, goals. Uh, so the goals for the Firebrand, as stated in their mission statement below their size, would be uh, to create lasting legacies, end tyranny, help the displaced, and to seek thrills. So if you want, you can say Rufa's Dance Academy. Uh, what, what, would, what would your goals be, Rufa? Um, do what your heart tells you. Mo- Move to the rhythm of the beat. Move. We, we will teach you to move to the rhythm of the beat of life and to uh, uh, listen to what your heart tells you in matters of joy. And uh, pelvic sorcery. E- now, here's the thing. Are you light side pelvic sorcery or dark side pelvic sorcery? Hmm. What part of the there, pelvic there, force there, do there's you... A, uh, there's a day version and the after dark version. Oh, okay. So it's not there's good and evil. There's just different energies of, of the mm-hmm. pelvic force. Exactly, exactly. There's a family friendly, and then there's for you know moms and dads. See, that just sounds like some gray Jedi bullshit to me. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm just imagining this entire like Star Wars uh, space opera, but instead of the force, it's like the pelvic force, and my mm. brain is. So sophomoric right now. Uh, Mal is we, 1974. We, we told you we want pelvic sorcery to become a system in your game some way. Yeah, let me let me go uh, talk to the guys at Paizo and see if we can create a uh, a sorcery bloodline called the pelvic bloodline, mm-hmm. um, or the pelvic ancestry. But also Malice 1974. Yes, steak and shake forever. Those little like. Um, Smash grilled burgers and those milkshakes and those teeny fries you can just shove and go. Oh, so good. Salivating. Yes, Reap. Uh, true to your heart from Mulan plays on repeat. <laughs> yeah. See, in my head, it's just make a man out of you on repeat, but that's just because that song's my jam. Uh, okay, so we talked about goals. We talked about size, location, kind of the mission statement, all that kind of fun stuff. Headquarters is mm-hmm. the next one. So while you may have, like the Firebrands, for example, because they are a loose organization of seniority, their headquarters is decentralized, meaning there's really no central headquarters they go to, no one they report to. But let's compare the absolute freedoms with the absolute law. And the Hell Knights headquarters is a citadel. Now, each different Hell Knight order has their own citadel, but that is still their headquarter. You go to that place. Mm-hmm. Talk to that guy. Yeah, Sydney, I'm hungry too. All this talk of like steak and shake is making me hungry. Um, so now this is where you get to grow. If you are, say, a player building your own organization or a GM building one, this is where it gets a lot of fun. Because now you have, after you've done all the logistics, where you've said the size, the alignment, the goals, the, the, the reach, the roster, whatever, now you get to build what heroes are in your organization. NPC time. Yup. And, and this, is, this is fun and it's light. It does not have to be hard. All it is is just naming them and giving them their appropriate rank, title, or, uh, uh, oath, et cetera, et cetera. You give so, a little flavor like this guy, he's a good guy, but he's kind of a jerk, you know, or this person, this person in charge of uh, issuing out equipment. And yeah, yeah. You know, little flavors here and there. Absolutely. And of course, the bigger your organization is, then there stands a reason there's going to be a lot of a lot more interesting characters. Mm-hmm. Or say you, the players, are making your own group, uh, your own organization. You can talk, you can put all your players' names in there, all their character names, and then talk about some of the NPCs working with them, a few of the NPCs you've hired. You get a really cool chance to kind of put on display. You're, you're all essentially of things. management, and then you have your workers. Absolutely. Uh, And then you have allies, which is next on the list. Mm -hmm. The allies are everyone that recognizes your organization as a positive. They work with you, right? And this is also cool because this helps you keep in mind everyone that has an actual like plus one, plus two, has the favorable mental status, which is a real 
status effect. Someone can become favorable to you with magic or checks. And so now you're building how big your network is socially. It's, so it's a really cool way to show who owes you favors, who likes you when you're in their town, what bartenders, you know, let you drink for free, whatever it is you want in your organization. Very, very cool. Uh, sorry, I, I think I, I cut you up at one point, by the way, Michael. Sorry if I did that. No, 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 it's cool. Um, then we next we have is uh, allies. Oh, we already talked about the allies. So after yeah. that would be enemies. Okay. En enemies. That would be basically uh, or organizations that you oppose or organizations that is basically against you, right? Absolutely, yeah. So it's like... A great example, if the Firebrands are absolute freedom and the Hellfire Knights are absolute law, then when you look at the Firebrands list of enemies, the first name on their list is the Hellfire Knights, or the Hell Knights, I'm sorry. They hate how these guys are like, the law, the law, the law, the law. You know, so they, they oppose them. So they do not get along. Whenever a Hell Knight sees a Firebrand, you know there's going to be a square up. There's going to be a lot of fighting going on. Or at least a lot of name calling. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Sydney and Reap, for uh, complimenting my NPCs. I really do appreciate that. I'm working really hard on building a ton more because I like to create a bunch of characters to fill out the world. So that means a lot. So much name calling. Yeah, so much name calling. Um, so we talked about allies and enemies. And by the way, everyone here in the chat, uh, when we're done going over this tool builder on how to build your organizations, because we have about 20 minutes left, we thought it'd be kind of fun if we took what's left of the time here to either build an organization in the world, maybe one you guys haven't met yet, or build a handful of organizations in the chat and then vote on it on Wednesday or maybe another episode of Edge of Legend to see which fan-made organization within this show Ooh. will become a permanent fixture of Edge of Legend. Mm -hmm. So if that sounds interesting to you, we can definitely do that. Um, if that sounds really cool, but maybe you want more people in the chat, we can always start now and continue in episode two and maybe continue in episode yeah. three of At the Table. Keep it fun and light. Yeah. But uh, really quick, uh, next we have is assets, which is what kind of equipment that uh, your organization has access to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so like, for example... Um, the door knocker. The door knocker. The firebrands have the door knocker. Mm -hmm. But the firebrands also, because they are pirates, for lack of a better word, they also have uh, contacts whenever they go to town, mm -hmm. and they have boats for transportation. Maybe one firebrand has, say, griffins they like to ride. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you have an orc who likes to ride griffins. But that is going to be something you want to write down as part of their or major a griffin assets. that likes to ride orcs. Or, yes. <laughs> I'm just imagining this massive griffin with like five orcs like strapped underneath them and the birds just like got them all by a ring going, ah, ah. And uh, like I said, uh, moving on, uh, we also really quick, so we get to the organization building, we have uh, membership requirements. Mm -hmm. So obviously the firebrands are open to anyone who wishes to join so long as they like, you know, mm -hmm you know, pass their test and everything. The Hellfire, I'm sorry, the Hell Knights bleh, are much more restrictive. You have to um, basically join the order. You have to pass a whole bunch of training, pass a whole bunch of tests. They're a lot more restrictive. You have to buy the secret ring, got to get the t-shirt, you know, all that stuff. Got to drink the Ovaltine. Uh, yep, yep, the, 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 the Kool-Aid. <laughs> now, um, the last uh, two or three bits here. This is important because this... speaks to the spirit of the organization, which is just as important as everything else we already mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, the one part is the accepted alignments. And this is important because, sure, the organization may be chaotic good, but not everyone who wants to join may be chaotic good. So what's the spectrum of personalities that your organization lets in? So the firebrand is chaotic good through uh, chaotic neutral. So you got chaotic good, popping to the left for neutral good mm -hmm. and then going down for chaotic neutral whereas the hellfire uh, the hell knights are all lawful good lawful. neutral evil straight down i, that I like to i like to think of this way where it's it, you have the alignment and then you're either one step away either way from it mm -hmm. 
because like I feel and I feel like we've all been there, right? Mm-hmm. Right, guys. Like where you play a character who's lawful good, neutral good, whatever, and you may have choices or moments that kind of dip into another ideology depending on how you define that central ideology. Mm-hmm. And then you get there's always that one player who's like, "That's not neutral good," and I'm like, "Bruh, come on, why are you like this, man? Dude. Like." You want me to harp on you every time you're not your limited alignment spectrum? Like, come on, dude. Al- alignment is not the end all be all. Yeah. And also, and alignment is very fluid. You could, it's constantly changing. I yeah. I think, I think really what it comes down to is that it is a guideline. Mm-hmm. It is a guideline for a greater idea of a personality. It is not a strict, walled up idea of how you have to play every aspect of your character mm-hmm. all the time. Yeah. Um, unless you are committing to actions that greatly break your code of conduct for your personality. Mm-hmm. And that's where the next two parts of the, of the organizations come into play here. So you have accepted alignments. Then you have your values. And as I'm sure Sydney is aware with her cleric, your anathema. Mm. So your values are the things that you hold dear, the aspects of your personality that you, you hold on to and the things you'll probably play the, prim- the primary mm-hmm. time or the, the most amount of time. Let's actually use uh, Cindy's character uh, as an example, like her, what her organization's uh, values and, and, and themes are like. Exactly. So, uh, well, she can probably speak more into that as they are her characters, but we, when we were working with the character, uh, because we're making homebrew gods and goddesses and deities, um, we basically took one idea of what her values were based on her goddess and then kind of created an anathema that made sense of that. Um, and so maybe if she wants to talk more about it, she can. Mm-hmm. Um, but the but values I'll, say... Hmm? Go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. All right, but the values of the firebrand is that they, uh, their values are to abolish all slavery, uh, to do exciting acts of daring and fun, and help those who can't help themselves. Mm-hmm. But their anathema is aiding any oppressive regime, hurting innocent people, and interrupting or sabotaging the daring deeds of others. Mm. So what's great about this as a player, you can see someone doing their best to have a good time and doing a bad job, and now you have a direct impetus to help that player. Not for anything that will benefit you, but because... Uh, that that's your that's your core belief, and what this will do on the table, the 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 metacognizant benefits, is that this helps create a player who is more fun to play with because they are lifting other players up in their endeavors, and this will stop players from roadblocking players who like, hey, I want to like swing on this rope and run on this roof and dive in this building. Well, if you're like, no, that's going to cause attention and blah blah blah. Well, now a firebrand would be like, dope. Let's do it. Like, they're there for it. Maybe they know it's dumb, but it's against their code. They're all in. They're all in. All in. Uh, Right. So that's kind of the the tool here. So all you got to do is plug in the values. Now, we got about 15 minutes before we have to call our first episode closed for the day. Um, But uh, I think – Yeah, let's uh, really quickly make some – at least use the – as an outline, and then later on we'll fill it in. What do you think, PJ? Yeah, let's do that. Let's uh, well, let me, let's let's first ask the audience. Um, since we have fifteen minutes left, do you want me to talk about one of the organizations in my world and build it in front of you, or would you rather do what I said before, where we're going to kind of pitch ideas and create one, and then we'll vote on it later? Because we're kind of low on time to be building options for an actual vote. That's my thought, anyway. Okay. Please put in the chat, or Michael, if you have any thoughts or opinions, let me know. Um, I personally, I think we have time to at least make uh, the spirit of the organization, and later on, we'll fill in the nitty gritty details. Like, let's think of a name and concept, and then okay. later on, we'll fill out the the stuff um, ourselves, and then we'll put okay. that up to a vote. So I have okay. So let's talk about this. Let's figure out. The organizations we wanted we want to do right mm-hmm. i have i obviously have a bunch of my game uh, in in the show that we can uh that we can bring up reap says he's down for either sydney says she's good with both hey malice uh what's your thought on this hopefully we can get malice's mm-hmm. attention i'm sure they're busy um so here's my you know, thoughts yeah yeah let's um, um yeah let's, let's just go ahead with let's do one at least one how about this just for funsies 
Mm -hmm. How about we build the Sticky Bun Orc Tribe? All right. That way, we can show this off and show the last vote of the show what they did, and we'll be like, yeah, you guys, this is cool. And next episode, both works. Malice agrees, both works. Yeah, okay, cool. Right. So let's do this. We are going to open up the Sticky Bun Orc Tribe, and since this was fan-made, we are going to uh, make a quick collaborative thing. Mm -hmm. So remember, the lore of this, this, the, the, the Bun Orc Tribe, the Sticky Bun Orc Tribe, is that they went missing due to infighting, and they had to leave their land after some, some bad things happened. So the first question is, what would you say is the alignment of this organization? Hmm. Personally, I think it would be they would be one of the few orc tribes who are not inherently warlike, so maybe neutral. Neutral something. Mm, neutral something, okay. I'm kind of seeing a neutral good, because I feel like, you know, there's that um, desire to make sticky buns, maybe? Mm -hmm. Yep. Reaped. Reaped says neutral good. I'm feeling neutral good. How's you feel neutral good, Michael? I'm, I'm feeling neutral good. Neutral good sounds good. Okay. So I, unless, unless anyone makes a good argument in the chat for why they shouldn't be neutral good, I'm going to write that down. Now, they are a tribe of orcs. However, they are a displaced tribe of orcs. They're, they're nomads. So what would we say is the size of this, of this organization? I would say because they're a displaced group, they're nomadic, they need to move around, my vote goes to small. Be around 100, 100, 100, maybe at most 150. Okay. Well, once we get about 150, we start bleeding into the medium territory. Mm -hmm. uh, around 100 then. Yeah. I mean, as a tribe, they're probably going to have a, a, a small but decent number of people. I can see, I can see small uh, people in the chat. What do you think? Are the sticky buns small? Are they medium? Or maybe they're gargantuan and we just never. Yeah. All right. Sydney says small and elusive. All right. Michael says small. Reap Psyche, what do you think? Should the sticky buns be small, medium, large, huge, gargantuan? What's your thought? I would say, me, like I said before, uh, to elaborate, small mainly for the fact that uh, they have to be mobile. And I'm thinking their st tribe structure is very family-based. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, Reap Psyche says uh, maybe medium. Uh, <laughs> Sydney's saying they're everywhere. We're all the sticky bun tribe. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, well, maybe they're gargantuan. Maybe they have over uh, 100,000 people or 10,000 people. And they're the tribes we of. met along the way. Uh, their tribe is the heart of the cards. Mm -hmm. All right, well, how about this? Why don't we say medium? And that way we can say they're low ball medium, about 150. Does that okay. sound good? Yeah. Okay. So now we have a neutral good medium tribe, and now we need to come up with their traits. Are they revolutionary? Are they lawful uh, enforcers? What would you say is a good way? Well, okay, are they revolutionary? Are they militaristic? Let me take a look at the list here yeah. that they give as examples. I'm for... wondering, is there, is there a, a, I'm pretty sure we could just make up our own too. So I, I would say crafters. They craft the sticky buns. Ooh, let's do that. Let's say it's um, I want to say like a guild or something, like yeah. an artisanal guild crafting. Yeah. Craft guilds. Go They're wonder bread. Guild. They're wonder bread. Yeah, I think craft guild is a good. Go ahead to that. Every bakery is sickery is sect of the sticky bun tribe. <gasps> I agree. We are legion. Yes, we are all. We are all sticky bun in our heart. So, all right. So right now we have the Sticky Bun Orcs tribe. They are a neutral, good, medium craft guild. Mm -hmm. uh, now, <laughs> now I'm just imagining archetypes building for the Sticky Bun tribe. Like, yeah, I'm an orc. I took uh, three levels of barbarian and nine levels of Sticky Bun. Um, but now we, have this, now we have to have the title of the organization synopsis. So kind of like the mission statements. Um, to travel and build the best buns. Finger licking, what? wait, that's, that's KFC. <laughs> finger, finger sticking good. How about that? 
Yes. <laughs> I'm down with that. All right. I'm going to make it finger sticking with an apostrophe over the end. Mm-hmm. Finger sticking good. Um, buns for all. Oh, God. That's their, that's their quirk. Yep. Buns for all. So now we can, to make the ultimate buns. Yes, Malice 1974, to make the ultimate buns, I'm going to make that uh, the continuation to, uh, don't put the M so close. Now, while I'm writing this, let's discuss uh, scope. How big uh, across the world, how, how widely spread are the Sticky Buns tribe? To bind the world with the frosting of camaraderie. Oh, God, we're about to go into some Team Rocket stuff. I can feel it. I would, I would personally say, they're kind of a, yeah, they're, they're more of a, like, to refer back to like, uh, like fast food franchises. Maybe they're a regional thing. Like they're all, they're on the, they're known across the, something coast of your world. I, I love that. I also love how Malice nineteen seventy four said <laughs> universal. Like they're are planets in this galaxy that no one's settled yet and sticky bun tribes are there with like big old shops going who wants my buns i want to say like they're like waffle house or in and out <laughs> reaped you're right giovanni would be an orc okay yeah so let's say maybe like a regional thing they're nomadic after all mm-hmm. they they can only travel so yeah far. They, they might they, they have maybe they migrate to uh, to gather ingredients when they're in season I could see that. So since they're nomadic, we'll say regional. Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and I will put up the details of what region they travel through later. Mm-hmm. Um, goals. Now, now we goals. Okay, goals. Mm-hmm. So uh, I've been seeing a lot of amazing stuff from Malice and from, from Reaped uh, about their goals. Hold on. Reaped just said Warhammer 40k orcs, but with baking instead of wag. I love it. Um, instead of pocket sand, it's Pocket flour. Pocket flour. So wait, <laughs> instead, of, instead of the wall reaped, what would it be? Would it be the rise? Oh, the yeast? What the would, yeast what would shall that... always rise. The yeast shall always rise. Uh, goals. No, 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 the, the sticky bun shall always rise. Kind of like the Dark Knight Rises, but it's a sticky bun. Nice. Uh, I'm going to go with some of the stuff we saw in the chat about making the mm-hmm. best buns and uniting all within them. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm also add because they're nomadic about having a sense of freedom, you know, uh, the yeast shall rise again. Maybe, maybe not. <laughs> maybe the, re- the yeast shall not rise again. Uh, uh, let's see here. Da, da, da. Uh, next would be, I believe, headquarters. Okay, well, I think we can kind of take a page out of the Firebrand's book here and say decentralized, since mm-hmm. they are a um, since they are a nomadic tribe. They really don't have one destination that is their headquarter. Uh, obviously, they have their carts and their miscellaneous sundries, but they don't mm-hmm. really have like a, a home. So I'm going to say decentralized. And then I believe we'll maybe. Be- Maybe, maybe in future acts or future campaigns, we can try to find a suitable home and let the Sticky Bun tribes settle somewhere. I would say maybe in a giant volcano. That's where they do all their baking. I think they, I think they die in a giant volcano. But who knows? We'll, we well, will. Well, like, like I said, like the Lord of the Rings volcano, they just use the outside where you know the rocks and everything to bake. Hmm. I like that reap psyche. The proof is in the dough. Yes, mm-hmm. it is. Or uh, the pudding? No. But uh, next up would be key members. Yeah, key members is going to be kind of hard because that's where you put all your, your NPCs or heroic people. And this tribe is kind of a mystery because they haven't really been seen for a long time. How about um, this? Do you want to create the mysterious uh, leader of the Sikibun tribe? 
Well, they are an orc tribe, and in my world, the orcs have a loose collection of people working together for the same goal to be the most efficient mm -hmm. in that goal as possible. So you could probably assume there'd be a chieftain, of course, uh, a grand champion. Baker? Ooh, how about this? How about we base the titles and people in chat? Let me mm -hmm. hold on, hold on. S Sydney said the Bun Lord. Bun Lord, that's going there. That's Bun Lord's there. Um, but I was going to say after, so, so Bun Lord, the sweetest, the sweetest chef, Master Chef instead of Master Chief. I like it. Um, what I was going to say was that we could make the ranks kind of like working in a kitchen. Yeah. So you have like head chef, uh, you have like your saucier, you have your um, patissier. I, w I would say it would be baking, the, a baking kitchen then. Because mm -hmm. different, there's there's actually different there's different uh, jobs in a in a bakery than there's is in the actual kitchen. Speaking as someone who has worked in that industry, I will I will respect your your knowledge and history mm -hmm. of that, and we can we can talk later about the different ranks of a yeah. baking kitchen. Because I, I I would imagine it's different only because I think saucier makes the soups and makes the broths and the sauces mm -hmm. but there no, but none of that really is involved with pastries so yeah like m the meat station and the appetizer station yeah okay so let's talk about allies and enemies then mm -hmm. really fast uh right. who would be an ally to the the sticky bun loving tribe well Let's do a quick rundown of the organizations we have met so far in your mm -hmm. world. Okay, yeah, let's talk about that. So in the world, we have met uh, the Red Rock Tribe of Orcs, the Black Spear Tribe of Orcs. You have met the Town Guard and the city mm -hmm. of Adelphon, and, and the capital city of Adelphon Prime. You have uh, met, of course, the denizens of um, Cobbledale. Uh, you haven't really had the chance yet to meet a lot of other people. There's been some little uh, um, drops I've placed in there for other organizations. Uh, however, you haven't quite discerned yet the organizations that those people come from. Can I make a suggestion? Sure. Because as we, uh, we know, the Ufgard, they're travelers. Good point. And hey. so are the sticky buns. They don't make maybe at some point that the sticky are both, the, are both yeah. organizations. Wow, Michael, we had a horrible uh Oh yeah, uh, horrible breakdown there. Yeah. Uh let's wait for the Twitch stream to catch up. Mm -hmm. Sorry about that at home. Yep. So yeah, so you're right. Wolfgard Company and Brotherhood of Dogs are two organizations we've met. Um <laughs> uh, I love that they're talking about uh, Ted Finn and Billimer, the OG Bun Boys. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, so let's see. So, so we know what kind of allies and enemies the mercenary companies would have. People who pay them and the people they attack, right? Mm -hmm. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. But if you are a tribe of nomadic orcs who've been dis displaced by orc problems, who would be your allies? Would they be strangers? Anyone on the road who seems nice? Other orcs? Maybe not other orcs? What do you think? I would say perhaps certain tribes of orcs. The orcs that caused them to become nom nomadic and displaced. Okay, so let's make this a bit broad here and just say um, positive or trusting strangers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because that could be other orcs. That could be things that are not orcs. People that are not orcs. Now, what would be an enemy? I thought that, 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 that we were just talking about that. No, that was the allies. What would okay. the enemies be? Then it would be perhaps the the orcs that caused them to be displaced. Okay. I will say unfriendly orcs. Slash orc tribes. Mm -hmm. Good, good, good. Who, okay. who basically look down on a neutral good orc organization? They're, they're like, you're not like the, you're not like us. You're, 
We don't like you. <laughs> mhm, mm mhm. Mm I would love to see who would win in a fight of who Gorm loves more. Does Gorm love the Black Spear or Red Rock tribes more, or does he love the people who are so nomadic that they don't even have a home, and they have tons and tons of burn scars from baking? Uh, okay, so I think we're going to stop there because it is about that time to end the show. But also, mm -hmm. we what we have uh, created is this uh, really good beginning template. Everything else would be more in depth, uh, uh, kind of spirit of the tribe. And I think we know what the spirit of the tribe at this point is. Uh, so really fast before we log off, I'm going to read this back to everyone, and we will maybe even produce this. Uh, oh, that's right. Gorm doesn't have favorites. He ignores all of his children equally. <laughs> um, mixing hot spoons, yeah, dangerous. Hey, hey, maybe, maybe this is the only peop the own his only children that he actually cares about. That's why they were displaced because they were the favorites. <laughs> he's like, he's like, he's, he's like, I love that one tribe, and by a small margin, I hate you all equally. I hate them a little less. Uh, so before we go, the organization, the bun-loving orc tribe that we have built, is a neutral good medium craft guild. They're their motto is finger sticking good buns for all and to make the ultimate buns. They are a regional group. Uh, their goal is to make the best buns and uniting all within it along the road to freedom. They are a decentralized group. Their key members um, are bun lord and more to follow. Their allies are the positive and trusting strangers they meet along the way and their enemies are unfriendly orcs and orc tribes that they encounter. So that is the bun loving orc tribe organization soon to have made up BS feats that I will create for no one because no one will be playing this class. But they have an organization. Maybe a one shot in the future. Maybe You're falling apart there, Michael. Was that... I said maybe a one shot in the future. Maybe a one shot in the future or maybe even um, an NPC you meet who is the Bun Lord himself with his own there stats. There we go. There we go. All right, so that has been episode one of at the table thank you so much for joining us and, and sitting down at the table with us and discussing all things tabletop and uh hopefully we'll do this bad boy again next week we'll see you yeah. all there we'll do more organizations and and make a list of them so we can then vote to see which one is going yeah. to join uh and maybe i'll even tell you about the order of the platinum hammer Ooh. more about that as that develops uh so yeah uh mr pow please uh say who you are where we can find you and we'll we'll close from there i'm michael pow and you can find me all over the interwebs on my social medias which are at mr kapow that's m-r-k-a-p-a-o or my uh, facebook page which is kind of my central hub that's facebook.com slash michael pow does stuff because i do a lot of stuff and I'm on, I play Rufa on Edge of Legends tomorrow, on um, Wednesdays at 8 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, and on Thursdays, I co-host a toy show called Toys Alive at 6 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Absolutely. Uh, my name is PJ McGaw. I've been the other half to this uh, awesome show. I had a lot of fun talking about this stuff and, and talking with you guys, uh, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again on this channel tomorrow night 8 p.m. where we will go live with episode 10 of edge of legend you'll see my man Rufa there you'll also mm -hmm. see sydney playing uh alona and the whole crew and we'll see what misadventures we can get up to in adelfon prime mm -hmm. not to mention a very spicy date mm -hmm. so double ditches Doo -doo -doo. So once again, I'm everywhere uh, online. It's pj.magaw. Uh, this has been Nat20 Productions at the table. Thank you for joining us at the table. And we'll see you next week at 3.30 to 5.30 p.m. on Tuesday. Later, guys. I love you.